Ex Machina made me rage, and Why the Last Man made me cry, but Paper Girls managed to do something even more rare than either of those. It made me... With Roof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus, aka the Mad Dog, and we're back with another video. Written by Brian K. Vaughan and illustrated by Cliff Chang, the first issue of Paper Girls was published by Image Comics on October 7th, 2015, with the 30th and final chapter being released on July 31st, 2019. The idea stemmed from Vaughan wanting to create a more personal and grounded story, having spent the previous three years at Image working on his biggest title with Saga, and the more fantastical elements were incorporated when he teamed up with Chang, as he decided on a time travel story that didn't just rely on the same tropes that had been carried across from films like Back to the Future that were just filled with hoverboards and flying cars, he wanted to do something that was a bit more balanced. In 2016, it won two Eisner Awards for the best new series and also for the best penciler slash inker. Colorist Matt Wilson won the Eisner for his category in both 2017 and 2019, and in that same year, Vaughn also won for the best writer, but he was also doing Saga. In 2019, it was reported that Amazon had picked up the rights for an adaption of the series, and later in 2020, it was confirmed that this had been ordered. And considering that it's Amazon, I'm surprised that it didn't arrive the next day. But Saga seems to be the go-to Brian K. Vaughan title that everybody talks about whilst he's been over at Image. But does Paper Girls deserve to stand on its own two feet? And can it manage to be one of Brian K. Vaughan's best books? This is my TLDW, it's a part of the video for people who maybe don't have time to watch the full thing, but you still want to know if the book's for you. And Paper Girls, more than anything, is fun. With a great cast of characters, vibrant art, and a true sense of setting, it's got pretty much everything that you'd want from an image series, even if maybe it doesn't stick the landing on the antagonists. And if that's all the review that you needed, thank you for tuning in. If this video reaches about 80 likes, I'll probably do a review of Why the Last Man. If you're new here, definitely make sure that you're subscribed and check out our sponsor, Organic Price Books. So if you want to treat yourself to a book because, you know, you deserve it, why not use the affiliate link in the description down below? And if you use code woof woof, you'll get $2 off your order. But now we're going to take a look at the plot. The story begins on November 1st, 1988. You know Emmy what, I get that this is going to be counterproductive to my retention rate and YouTube will probably drop this video into the abyss along with that Umbrella Academy review that I did. But if you're intending on reading Paper Girls, then stop watching this video. You know, still like and subscribe obviously, and you should be safe in the final verdict, there's going to be a timestamp down below. But I enjoyed this book so much because it was a complete blind read and I don't want to take that opportunity away from you. So yeah, this is probably one of the rare occasions when I actually recommend that you stop watching one of my videos, but I just want you to enjoy this book. But if you do want to know a bit more about it, or maybe you've read it already, then, you know, I'm just going to hand it back to voiceover Marcus. The story begins on November 1st, 1988, where Erin, a 12-year-old who delivers papers in a new town of Stony Stream, meets with three other delivery girls, Mac, KJ and Tiffany. When one of the walkie-talkies is stolen by a group of teenage boys, they chase them to an abandoned warehouse where they stumble on a time machine. This throws them all across the past and the future, confronting their own destinies and finding themselves in the middle of a war that could destroy the fabric of existence. But what happens when the girls are confronted by their own future? Will they ever be able to return home if they can't even figure out where they are? And when life gets tough, will the bond between these four paper girls be strong enough to survive? Cliff Chang is a great artist, there's no doubt about that, but I do often find that I have to be in the right mood to read a book that is illustrated, although it's something I can never decide until I start reading that book, and fortunately, I was in the right mood when it came to Paper Girls. From the start, it's just spot on, there's this confidence in the work from the beginning, and it remains consistent throughout. Even some of my more favourite image titles like Invincible, the art from Otley didn't start off at its peak, you can tell that he had to grow into that title, but with Chang, it just hits the ground running and it doesn't really ever lose any steam. It has this flat 2D look to it, but also has this vibrant neon colouring that makes it pop and has a retro feel. Credit to Matt Wilson on that part. I previously read Wonder Woman New 52 because obviously it's my jam, and I love Chang's art throughout that, and there is a lot of similarities between that and Paper Girls, but this was just on a different level. And just to go back to the use of colour, I find myself noticing how tone was conveyed through primary colours. I like that night was created using blue instead of black, and light was done with yellow instead of white. As well, the setting does change a lot during this series, and each time there's an immediate sense of identity, to the point where the terrains that are from our time look familiar and recognisable. Each time we're transported to a different location, it always has a different look and feel to it, but not to the point where you think that somebody else is doing the art. It manages to walk the tight balancing act between being consistent and adaptable. All the characters were given their own sense of identity that just made them engaging from their introductions. And with a series like this where the plot just begins from issue 1, we didn't need an entire first arc to build up 
up what was going to happen, it was integral to have that so that you knew exactly who each character was. I also like the way facial expressions were illustrated because it managed to convey quite a comedic tone that I don't think many other artists could have done without making it feel somewhat stupid. Like it's funny but it never takes away from the seriousness of the situation that's going on. It has that childish nature to it which does help you to remember the age of these characters because oftentimes you could forget. There was just so much detail as well and I feel like Cliff Chang is one of those illustrators that's simplistically complex. At first glance there is a cartoony aspect to it, especially with the flat look and the blocky colours, but during most scenes you can look deeper and see all of the bottles on the table, the brand of electronics and every hair in someone's beard. It reminded me a lot of Darwin Cook and I hope that people don't judge Cliff Chang at surface level because there's a lot to love here and it's hard to imagine another artist working on this story. Paper Girls is just one of those books where everything came together right and I often hear it spoken about as Brian K Vaughan's work but it's great because of all of the elements so Chang deserves as much respect from this title and it should be talked about as one of his best. This is a damn good book. If that wasn't evident already, I'm going to go fully on the record. And the thing is, it seems like I've got a reputation for nitpicking when it comes to my reviews, which I actually kind of take as praise, but there isn't much that I disliked with this one. At least not that I can say without getting into spoilers. Firstly though, I just have to commend the pace of this book because it was phenomenal and that's what really stuck out to me. I think I got through the first hardcover in two sittings and it wasn't really too much different for the other ones. And as much as I love Saga and Why the Last Man, I was thinking to myself that maybe Vaughn works best in this issue range where it's 30 or less. Although I didn't like the prehistoric arc as much as the others, it didn't leave you there for so long that it became a problem. If anything, that might be one of the few nitpicks that I have for this series because I wanted to spend more time in some of these locations. But this pace did help give the book this sense of being lost, displaced, and never having enough time to figure out what was going on. It was something that carried throughout the series and really helped you to empathise with the characters quickly without the needing to be too much endless build up. And that feeling of escalation worked its way into the narrative, which which I felt was handled fantastically. And it reminded me of TV shows like 24 and the early seasons of Lost, which, you know, BKV did a few episodes of. Every final page of an issue immediately made you want to read the next, and it avoided the trap that Ex Machina fell into of having the biggest poll being in the first issue, but then not really having anything else to back it up with. This book showed stamina, endurance, and it could go the full course, and... Now it sounds like I'm describing some kind of horse. And one thing that I've never been able to fault BKV on is his character development. It is something that I'll have to elaborate on in spoilers because it was a bit of a double-edged sword, but you do go through a journey with these characters. But over the 30 issues, that changes and develops, but nothing about it doesn't feel authentic. As well, I like that a majority of the secondary characters added something for at least one of the core four. However, that does bring me to one of the only problems that I had with this series, and that's that I can barely tell you anything about the antagonists. Yeah, for some reason I have a weird lisp on certain words and antagonist seems to be one of them. But don't worry, nothing's changed since my last review so I am still the resident dumb guy of the YouTube comic book community and the antagonists were explained but they just never had a presence. When I started this book I wasn't expecting there to really be someone for the girls to go up against but since it was introduced I would have liked for them to have been more memorable. The concepts of who they were were really cool but nothing was done to make it more than just a concept. The main focus of the story, and rightfully so, was the girls trying to return to their own time. So having someone come after them didn't feel like something that the book needed, and if anything it did feel like it was an afterthought. In a weird way though, I have less to say when I really enjoy a book, because it's the bigger things that I loved. So once I've touched on stuff like the pace, the characters and the setting, there isn't too much for me to say. So having a shorter spoiler free section is actually a good thing for this series, because it does all the main things so well. So if I'm not talking it up more, and if it feels like I talk more about books that I don't like, it's because of the fact that it just does everything that it needs to do correctly. So instead of just padding this out for any longer than it needs to be, I'm just going to jump into the spoiler section. First up though, the one thing that did really bug me about this book, I wasn't really a fan of the coming of age moments. Like that scene where KJ got a period and then other people sort of mentioned it in passing, but it didn't really add anything to the story. Like sure, yes, that is something that can happen around that age, but for me, something just feels off about a grown man talking about a 12 year old getting a first period. And then it's made even worse just because of the fact that the rest of the story just carries on anyway, like it doesn't change anything. Like to me, I was just like, okay, of course, yeah, sure, we have to be there as one of them 
gets the first period, why wouldn't we be? And the relationship between Mac and KJ, I wanted to like, but again, it just didn't feel comfortable because of the fact that they were both 12 year olds. And I think the reason why it really threw me out of the book a bit was because Vaughn said that he was trying to make a book that didn't really focus around girls that were just trying to get the attention of boys. So he wanted a story where they were more focused just on their friends and buying cool shit with the paper money. That's fine, and I thought that was the book that I was going into, but I did actually love them as a couple, so I'm really conflicted with this part of the story. Maybe I'm making a bigger point out of this than it needs to be, but I didn't really feel right as a 27 year old man hoping that two 12 year olds get together. But did like that there was a hint in the last issue that they may continue with their relationship, even if it was in that dream sequence. Because there was all these hints that the things that they had done whilst they were going through this time travelling experience, that they weren't all for nothing. Obviously you had Tiffany remembering the phrase that they weren't just paper girls, they were friends, so it gave you that hope that as they got older they did get together and that'd be a book that I'd like to see. I've just never been the kind of person that wants to watch two 12 year olds getting off with each other, that's just not my thing. Speaking of Mac, thank God. God, they didn't kill her. I really wasn't ready for that, and I was certain that it was going to happen, even if it would have just been that they got sent to the point in time where she actually died. And this was one of the main good things that came about from them having the minds wiped, because I wasn't really too sold on that as a concept, but having that reassurance that Mac now doesn't have to live with the knowledge of what's going to kill her just almost made it all worthwhile. Her attitude was pretty ballsy too, and she was probably my favourite of the core four. I felt like even though all the main characters were individuals, she was the one who'd already understood who she was. She knew what the world was about, and how she wanted to live her life. Without her, I think the story wouldn't have worked as well or been as engaging because the other three did share quite a lot of similar traits. But whilst I'm speaking about the group, the four of them referring to each other as Ninja Turtles for codenames was great. I love when nostalgia is like this and it works in the context of the story, rather than just basically pointing at something to go, here's a thing from the real world, and yeah, I'm talking about you, Big Bang Theory. The end issue was really sweet as well, and I think that this is the first time in a long time that I've actually been so happy with how a book ends. It just just left me with a good feeling that I felt like it earned, which I don't really get too often. I like that it's clear that they're probably still going to stay friends, whereas before it was always hinted that they were probably going to go their separate ways. And it reminded me a bit of the end of Terminator, which is weird because there was a Terminator reference in it, but it's that belief that we create our own destinies. Not everything's set in stone and we can change our own future. So you know, maybe it's possible that Mac might survive, maybe her and KJ will get together, maybe Erin will find a more fulfilling life for herself, or Tiffany might go down a different path. But do think it was a little bit cheap having the characters minds wiped. It just made me wonder what the point was and it's similar to those oh it was all a dream type endings. But to go back to my last point, it worked in the sense that I was initially a bit disappointed that the girls wouldn't remain friends, especially with all the foreshadowing that went on throughout the book, but they decided to stay together and there was a more hopeful future waiting for them. And that little scene of Wari driving in front of Erin so that she can save her from getting run over, I just thought that was a beautiful moment. Wari was a character that I didn't really know how I felt about her because I didn't really like her or dislike her. She was just somebody that was there for the moment, but I liked Old Warrior a lot more and this scene at the end just solidified that for me. There was just a lot to love by the end of this series and it was more so impressive because of the fact that at issue 29 I thought that it was going to end up disappointing me. One thing though that I wasn't really a massive fan of was just those weird dreams, especially the one at the start of the book because it didn't add too much for me until the end. In all honesty because it's been a few years since I last read it, I thought the dude that showed up at the beginning of this book was a character from Saga. But it might make me a hypocrite, but at the end of the day, everybody's a hypocrite in some way or another. But I did really like the one where Tiff became the Tiffinator. If you put a Terminator in anything, I'm pretty much guaranteed to enjoy it. Unless, of course, it's like any Terminator film after Terminator 3. The end pages, though, were just so mega in this. Even in issues that might not have been as well paced as previous ones, the last page would just bring you right back into the story. From the apple reveal to Erin getting shot, realising Mac will die, and Tiffany confronting a few future self. I wasn't sure if BKV planned all of these out in advance and then found a way to bring the narrative to that point by the end. If that wasn't the case then the maddest of mad respect to BKV to be able to craft his story like that so that he can just spontaneously put these amazing cliffhanger moments in without it being pre-planned. Just whilst I'm on that though, Ballsy move from BKV to shoot a 12 year old early on in the story. It just set the tone that he's not afraid to do things that other books wouldn't and it didn't have a clue what might happen. It also added some authority to the threat that Mac was going to die because if he's willing to shoot his main character pretty much in like the first five issues, he is more than willing to kill one of them off. So good on him to actually take the initiative to do this because it made me feel that anything could happen at any moment. I touched on it in the spoiler free section but I'll just expand on it here. But I didn't care about the war between 
between the old timers and the time travellers, Japo did not interest me in the slightest. It was fun seeing him just be a crazy old man, but there was never a moment where I felt like he was a threat. I guess then that's why I was okay with the ending deliberately being an anticlimax, because normally that kind of thing would piss me off. Because it would have had to have made him a lot more powerful for it to feel like he was an authentic villain. Although, when they did go to the year 2000, I loved the fight with the mechs that was just casually going on in the background. There was one issue as well that I have to give a lot of respect to. There's a lot of moments in here, admittedly, where they just tried a load of different things, and the vast majority of them worked, but there was one issue in particular where four stories are happening at once. And it is a bit confusing to keep track of at first, but the amount of craft that must have been needed to do that is phenomenal. I've seen books try it with two storylines and be able to bounce comfortably, but four? And still not really lose that cohesion and still allow you to know what's going on in each of those four stories? I would love to learn more about the construction of this book, and there isn't many titles where I've been that invested in the behind the scenes. There is a lot to love about this book, a lot that I could talk about in this spoiler section, but those are the main points that I thought about when I was making my notes. No, my luck, as soon as I upload this video, there's going to be one major thing that I completely forgot to mention. But yeah, one final note, and there's no way that I can't mention this, the design of those machines is a 100% lookalike from the bots in Power Rangers Time Force. This is my final verdict, and I said at the beginning of this video that Paper Girls managed to do something that most other books can't, and that was that by the end, it made me smile. As your resident, self-confessed stupid reader on YouTube, I didn't really see too much deeper meaning throughout this book, but I don't need a thought-provoking subtext to enjoy this book. And it's weird because I think it's actually the exact opposite of East of West, which is what I reviewed previously. That was so caught up in its meaning and its messages, they often forgot that it was supposed to be telling you an engaging story. But Paper Girls first and foremost just wanted you to be entertained, which is all I ever really want from a comic. I didn't know what I was expecting when I first read Paper Girls, and that's what's great about it. I was given a great time travel story with an interesting cast of characters and an art style that was essential to the tone of this book. I don't think it's perfect, I wasn't really a massive fan of the antagonists, and I don't really appreciate all of the coming of age moments within this story, but surprisingly those minor nitpicks that I've got didn't detract from the overall experience. Sometimes it's just good to be reminded that comics are a form of entertainment, and Paper Girls managed to do that with an engaging sci-fi mystery that built to a crescendo at the perfect peak of every single issue. Currently. I think this is tied with Why the Last Man for Brian K. Vaughan's best book, because Saga isn't complete yet so I can't really judge it as a whole, and this is just Cliff Chang at his best. It comes very highly recommended for fans of Image Comics, Brian K. Vaughan, Cliff Chang, and even just general sci-fi, because I'm going to give this a very high score of 85%. Woof woof! So that's my review of Paper Girls and I'm hoping that you've enjoyed it. If you've read this series, let me know what you think about it in the comments section below. There's also going to be a discussion over on our Reddit page, r slash community, so come join us there. And like I said, if this video gets 80 likes, I'll review Why the Last Man in pretty much the immediate future. But if you did like this video, give it a thumbs up, and if you didn't, why did you get this far? Definitely make sure that you subscribe if you're new here. I'm currently reading Batman Hush, and that's going to be my next review. Share this video where you can. I know that there's a lot of people that are interested in this series, and they don't know if it's for them. And like I said, if you're tempted to pick up this book or any others, I'd definitely recommend a sponsor, Organic Price Books. But until next time, whenever that may be, just make sure that you stay safe. Stay reading the best books that you can find, and stay mad all you dogs, woof woof, see you at the next video.